All right. Do you hear me? OK, good. Um, welcome to the next session, which is about exits. Is here anyone in the room who dreams or is in the process of getting an exit for his company? Not yet. Perhaps a merger or acquisition? Um, my name is Pekka Pekkala. I'm a freelance tech writer for Helsinki Sanomat, a big newspaper here in Finland. And uh, here we have a panel which is titled um, Exits uh, Before, During and After. And we start with a small, short introductory round starting from Maya. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Maya Itkonen. Um, I founded the company PowerKiss a few years ago. Uh, doing wireless charging for mobile devices. Um, a few months ago, we were acquired by an American-Israeli company called PowerMat, more like a competitor. So um, currently, I work for design and marketing position in this PowerMat company. Hi, everyone. My name is Sampo Barke. I'm the co-founder of Rapid Blue Solutions. Uh, we are a retail analytics company, effectively a Google Analytics for the real world. Uh, we were acquired this summer by a US-based uh, people county company, Shopper Track, the market leader in that space. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mikko Sarno. I'm the uh, co-founder of, of Sensinode. Uh, we were acquired by Arm in mid-July this year. Uh, we are machine-to-machine -machine communications, IoT software pioneer. Hello, my name is Otto Hilska. I'm the founder of Flowduck. It's a team communication tool. Uh, we started it in 2009, and we got acquired in February by Rally Software from Boulder, Colorado. So these all exits or mergers or acquisitions have happened actually this year. So there's lots of other things going on than Supercell in Finland. And um, let's start from a question. Um, how did you know when it's the right time to do the exit or the merger? And Sampo, you told me that you were actually looking for uh, funding and uh, kind of the exit idea came at the same time. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we were about to raise a, a, a Series A round of funding. And, and uh, you know, we got, we got a call from one of our, our strategic partners, a European company, and they essentially said that, oh, let us buy you. We want, we're interested in buying you. And, that's something that you know sparked the discussion. That all right, you know, should we in fact go for funding, or should we look at you know who else is interested? And that's where the process got started and ended up in the in the acquisition. How did you know it's the right thing or right time to do it? Well, I mean, obviously we didn't know it was the right time. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if you can ever know if it's the right time to do. It was just a convenient time in, in the sense that we knew that we needed more funding and, at, uh, and would have needed more funding this summer. In fact, late this summer. Um, so we scouted around, and I think the most important part of it was that we found the right fit. So we found an acquirer where you know, our company, the product that we had developed, was in fact an important part of their future. And that was a very big thing for us. So when we found that, we realized, all right, this, this might actually be the right thing to do, whether it's the right time or not. Well, you know what? I still don't know if it was the right time or not. You know, the future is going to tell that. Depends how the market goes. Yeah, actually, I agree with uh, everything you said about the right fit, but also the timing is best when you get the best negotiation result. And typically, a funding round is a great time to do that because others are evaluating your company as well. So you have others kind of giving competing offers. So I think you timed it pretty well. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Maya? Yeah, I would also say that it's not just about like right timing. I would also say that. Like, for example, the situation in this, in this other party, you know, for example, what kind of ideas they have for their future, like what uh, uh, focus areas do they have, it might also change that, you know, if you're just saying that this is not the right time for me, then it might really change. But, um, yeah, we were also negotiating it about, about the funding round, but actually, I think it was very nicely put that um, this main owner of this company who, who acquired, uh, he said after after one like the first day negotiation, he said that, you know, I have to say that you can't get half married, you have to get fully married. So so he just get a feeling that we have to do this now, otherwise it's it's gone. So this is something, yeah. So Mika, you told me that you were looking to grow as a company, and that was one of the reasons that you 
decided to um, do a merger? Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, I, I, I could, you know, sign pretty much everything that Sambo said already, and and for us, it was really a, a kind of, you know, decision either doing a big B round or or then get acquired. Uh, we were also, you know, you know, discussing funding and B round, and then then our acquire arm just told us that you know, we we might as well buy you off, and and for us, the real really the why we were doing all that was because we had a technology vision and, and vision what we wanted to do with the technology and where we wanted to build the company and, and the business. And really there was, you know, it required more resources. It was, you know, decision between B round, big B round or then get acquired by somebody who could provide the resources. So, so what about the time of doing actually the, the merger? Um, Otto, you told me that um, the process was pretty, you know, complicated. You managed to create quite a lot of paperwork as well. Yeah, the final contract actually weighed, weighed 1.8 kilograms. So uh, apparently, obviously, we also spent quite a bit of money on on the lawyers. Uh, selling a Finnish company to an American company is not as easy as it could be. There's, you need lawyers who have expertise on both sides and all that, so it can get pretty complicated, but luckily we kind of had a getting shit done attitude and tried to kind of tell our lawyers not to delay everything too much because they get caught on minor details. Mikko, you got uh, uh, bought by a, a company that is specialized in IP. Yeah. So how was the process for you when, when the company was probably looking through your papers pretty carefully? Yeah, you know, like Arm is an IP company, so they, they did, we did do a pretty, pretty thorough uh, due diligence on IP and patents and, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, in, in all things considered, it was a really smooth process. I mean, we were, well, you know, like we were talking with them a few months before, kind of getting things started. But when we, you know, kicked up the, you know, kicked up the speed and um, started really working on it, it was maybe four or five weeks, everything done. So it was very quick. Right. Um, Samba, you you told that you actually hired um, outside firm, an investment bank, to help you. Yeah, we did. I mean, I mean, I mean. Listen, let's face it. I don't think any entrepreneur is going to say that the due diligence process in being acquired was, was nice and 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 pleasant. And you got to remember, on the, on the side, you actually have to run your business. So you have these guys that are going through your documents. You have piles and piles of documents. And I agree with Otto. You know, having an American acquire, you know, especially the amounts of documents, you know, the language, the legal fees, all of that. And you have to run your own business, and you have to grow it because you're not sure that this is going to materialize. So, so what we ended up doing, in fact, is is we uh, we hired an investment bank to to help us with the help us navigate through the process, and that was by far the best decision we made in that process. I mean, investment banks are you know, they cost they cost a lot of money, but my God, was that the right thing to do for us? Yeah, we did exactly the same thing, and it you know. I it saved us a huge amount of time and effort. Yeah. yeah. All right. If there are investment bank people in the audience, they are smiling properly right now. <laughs> um, Maya, how was your process um, of, of getting together with the competition, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think this, this position that you, you're negotiating with a competitor, I think that's, that's actually something quite interesting as well. Um, as said, yes, you need to run your own business at the same time, and in a way, kind of like uh, keep um, like uh, keep your mind cool, just to just to be sure that in case this doesn't work, you still will survive. So you haven't really, even though you open everything, you still kind of like have some some things that you know that are just fully yours. But um, I think that. Yes, okay, the legal process was horrible and everything, just like everybody can say. But um, I, think, I think mentally um, it was maybe not that hard because, because we, are like, we have very, very different strengths. And therefore, it's kind of like that, that we are just opening new doors for them. So in a way, I would say that that saved me. <laughs> um, how does the process go in, in, in general? Um, who knows about the negotiations in, in, your, in, in your case? Who, who knew about it and, and when did you tell 
to a larger audience and, and so on? Um, uh, in the beginning, just the board knew, you know, just the board and the board of the other company. Uh, yeah. Um, how about you? Yeah, we, we have a bit of a different story. I mean, obviously, essentially, the, when we first started discussing, um, then it was obviously the board and the founders. But by the time it actually got to the process that, you know, the, the part that we said, all right, let's go into exclusivity, into due diligence, and that, you know, the, uh, our acquirer was, ex you know, they were explicit about the fact that they wanted the entire team to know that this is going on. So they wanted everyone, all the people who work for us, they wanted them to know. So we essentially told everyone. Uh, we obviously not our clients, but just our internal team that this is going on. What about you, Mikko? How, uh, who knew when you started negotiating? Yeah, for us, it was only board and, and shareholders. Well, not even all the shareholders. It was, there was a couple of minority ones that basically board and, and, and investors and founders. Uh, mainly because, because the uh, arm was uh, and is a uh, listed company in the London Stock Exchange. So they had all kinds of rules. On, on announcing those kind of things, so uh, and we actually we were able to able to tell the employees only when everything was closed already. So, but you all, all agreed that um, you, you are going to sell. So there was no. Oh yeah, no yeah. there was no you know, no disagreements at all for us because we were you know we kind of had been talking with between you know the founders and and in the board and and with the our VCs. On, on the possible exit you know, in advance already. You know, everybody knew what everybody else was thinking about, the exit, potential exit, what was everybody's goal. So we were always very op open about it internally. So there was no surprises to anyone. So, How about you, Otto? Well, initially it was just the founders and the investors, but obviously when you see a bunch of uh, American businessmen flying in and inviting everyone for a dinner and everyone has a CEO, CFO kind so of So you title. didn't have secret uh, yeah. meetings in a <laughs> so, hotel in London or New York? Yeah. So, so we shared, um, we already shared with employees early on that we're talking to a bunch of uh, people who are interested in acquiring us, but we're mostly doing this to get a better deal for our funding round. But when we signed our term sheet, uh, Independence Day last year, uh, then we shared that with, the whole, with everyone in the company. Okay, as a journalist, this of course infuriates me because it's so always, no matter what size the business is, it's always a very close, small group that is actually mm -hmm. not aware of the whole process. Um, uh, let's go to the point where you, you've done the sale and you kind of look back into the process, what, what happened and, and what could I have done better? So, Mikko, what do you think, um, what do you wish you knew before going through the process? What would be, be your advice for people uh, thinking about uh, merger? Uh, I, you know, I, honestly, I can't think of anything that I would have done differently. Uh, for us, you know, like maybe we were a little bit lucky, I don't know. You know it was my first exit. Uh, but you know, everything was really smooth. You know, the, the guys at the arm were really cool about everything. You know, it, it worked out for us really nicely. Um, I think you know, I, I, you know, what I kind of mentioned already, you know, I think it would be very important for the shareholders and, and, and founders and the VCs to talk about the exit potential in advance so that there's no surprises. I think that's, that's pretty important. How do you have that question, uh, discussion? Who, who starts the discussion saying, I think we should sell? What, what should we do? Um, I, mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, for, for us, we were always kind of you know, you know, occasionally talking about, it, you know, hey, we're now working with this company. I think they actually would be a great match for us if they would you know, acquire us someday. You know, it was, it was very, all very casual. But you know, the, the, the important part was just to communicate and talk about these things. Um, you know, it, it, it was very, very informal for us. Um, Otto, any advice for people considering an exit or selling? Well, just kind of not getting blinded by the idea of getting a lot of money all of a sudden. You still need to do a lot of due diligence. Uh, 
they are doing a lot of due diligence on you, and you should be doing the same. And it's kind of difficult to even realize what are the questions I want to be asking myself because I've never sold a company, and I don't know what it feels like to work for a larger company. So uh, luckily, we had good investors who kind of gave me those questions to ask myself, and that was kind of key because everyone also had an opinion about that, but usually they didn't know much about the situation and they would after two seconds skip to say that yeah you should sell or you should not that's not relevant but kind of getting the mentors to guide you through the process that was really helpful um how about you maya how what's your advice mm -hmm. okay first of all i would say that you can't dream about getting acquired you really have to focus on what you're doing and understand that if you really want to get acquired you won't get acquired so uh, as, as near as it comes to you, you really still need to keep the focus fully on what you're doing. And um, yeah, then I also would say that, that um, don't be afraid, like once you have decided that this is the right thing to do, then, then just don't blame yourself and think about that maybe there is still another way and maybe I should have done something differently. So when, once you are there, just trust your instincts and, and understand that just uh, jump on the flow and everything will be fine. And Sambo, other than hiring an investment bank to help? Um, well, I, I have to completely agree with Maya. I mean, in, the reality is that an acquisition is just the possible result of all the things that you did well whilst you know, you're running your business. And um, I mean, you know, for me, it taught a lot about just generally how to build a startup. Uh, so for all of you startups out there, all your ideas, put them in writing from the second you have those ideas, because those writings and drawings can be quite important in the IPR section of the due diligence, which is horrible, by the way, that particular section. Um, so uh, you know you can you, know, you can potentially have a, a fewer uh, few less gray hairs if you have everything you ever thought of doing with your business documented from the first moment. Um, so yeah, and then the investment bank that was definitely a good call. And you know the other thing is that you got to keep your cool in this type of acquisition process because the potential acquirers are gonna they might just you know, shoot out questions that you think are just idiotic and out of place and why are they asking me this and you know, our acquirer had, you know, they were asking questions two days prior to closing which we thought they should have asked two months ago because they had all the opportunity and you know, just don't let things like that get to you because it's, you, know, you can really lose sleep over that type of stuff. Yeah, you, you all told me that you, at least somebody in your company had spent sleepless nights or work 24-7 to get things going, especially the final days before, before the final agreement. Um, so now that you all become fa fabulously rich, of course, because you sold your company, and um, so what are you doing now? What are your plans? Are you retiring? What happens after, after all this? Are you still working or an active role? You, you can start. <laughs> I'm definitely not retiring. Uh, so for me, I don't think you know. I don't think that much has changed in in the sense that you know, I'm still working for the company. That was the deal that we made. Uh, the entire team is still working. You know, the company that acquired us and investing in Finland, they're acquiring. Uh, they're not acquiring, but they're recruiting here, possibly also acquiring. You never know. Uh, but um, but they're recruiting into into Helsinki and uh, and yeah. I mean, not that much has changed. I mean, it's it's. I don't think you know, any any entrepreneur really who wants to make a successful business thinks about the money. You know, the money is again just a byproduct of of whatever you've done done well. So so I don't think it really needs to change that much, and I don't think it has in my case at least. What about you, Maya? Uh, yeah, I really do not feel like <laughs> getting retired soon. Um, uh, for me, I would say the main difference has been that I have m more people to be responsible of and you know the team members are just uh, shattered all over the world. But uh, personally, uh, yes, I do have all these non-termination clauses that I, I really can't leave the company now. But at the same time, I also feel that you know I have so many dreams still be fulfilled that I really feel that, that I wouldn't even like to, like to leave at this point. So uh, let's see again after one or two years.
Um, what about you, Otto? Um, have you quit working or are you still with the company? No, same story, uh, still with the company. Everyone from the team is still with the company and uh, Flowdog is not ready. We need to continue building it. So we still have that vision that's still there. So, and we're growing in the team in Helsinki. Yeah, being an entrepreneur sounds quite a bit different than winning in a lottery or something like that. That you, you keep working and you are not doing all those things that we see in the advertisements. Um, how about you? Uh, same thing. I mean, like it's it's. You know, I, I guess if 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 your company would get acquired in a stage where you you know have you know, like would be you know, like huge profits, you know, like kind of a very mature business. Maybe at that point you might be, you know, might consider doing th something like that, you know, moving to something new right away. But for us at least, you know, we are, as, as I said earlier, you know, one of the reasons we actually wanted to get acquired was uh, was to actually be able to, you know, like do things a little bit differently, get a better resourcing, stuff like that. And and you know, we pretty much, you know, I think everybody in our team still feels that you know, we've got still stuff to do. We're not there yet. So we've got, we got stuff, things to do. So. And you know, about money, you know, I got, well, I took my wife to Paris, so that's, that's, that's what I've been spending on. <laughs> I think that's a good way to spend money. Um, that concludes our panel. Uh, let's give a big hand for our panelists here. Thanks. And we'll be on that side of the stage, if there is any media or people who want to ask questions, so come ahead and on that side of the stage. Thank you.